compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled product or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, content experts, and their spouses and or partners wish to disclose they have no financial interest or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Planners have reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. Content will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use with the exception of Dr. Groskoff's discussion of influenza vaccines. She will be discussing the use of influenza vaccines in a manner recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, but not approved by the Food and Drug Administration. CDC did not accept commercial support for this continuing education activity. Welcome to Influenza Vaccination Recommendations 2015-2016. During this program, we will describe the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices Influenza Vaccine Recommendations, describe the benefits of influenza vaccination, describe best practices for influenza vaccine storage, handling, and administration. Implement disease detection and prevention healthcare services, for example, smoking cessation, weight reduction, diabetes screening, blood pressure screening, immunization services to prevent health problems and maintain health. Influenza is a highly infectious viral illness that can cause serious illness and even death. It is estimated that in any given year, between 5 and 20 percent of the U.S. population become infected with an influenza virus. Most cases will cause several days of illness, but will resolve without the need for medical care. The severity of influenza illness depends on a person's prior immunologic experience with influenza viruses, any underlying chronic diseases, and the strain of influenza with which they get infected. The incubation period for influenza is usually two days, but varies from one to four days. Classic influenza illness is characterized by the abrupt onset of fever, myalgia, sore throat, non-productive cough, and headache. Additional symptoms may include rhinorrhea or runny nose, headache, substernal chest burning, and ocular symptoms such as eye pain and sensitivity to light. Children are more likely than adults to have nausea and vomiting. The most frequent complication of influenza is pneumonia, either as a direct viral infection of the lungs or a secondary bacterial pneumonia caused most commonly by Streptococcus pneumoniae or Staphylococcus aureus. The risk for complications and hospitalizations from influenza is higher among persons 50 years of age and older, children younger than five years of age, persons of any age with certain underlying medical conditions, pregnant women, and American Indians and Alaska Natives. An average of more than 200,000 hospitalizations per year are related to influenza, more than 50% of which occur among persons 65 years of age and older. CDC recommends a flu vaccine as the best way to protect against influenza. Flu vaccines protect against three or four different influenza viruses, depending on which vaccine formulation is administered. Influenza vaccination can reduce the number of flu illnesses and prevent serious outcomes like flu-related hospitalizations. Vaccination is especially important for persons at high risk of serious flu-related complications and their close contacts, including healthcare personnel. During the 2014-2015 influenza season, flu vaccines were not as effective as usual. The circulating H3N2 virus was very different from the H3N2 virus in the vaccine, and it was the most common influenza virus which circulated in the U.S. This resulted in vaccine effectiveness of only 23% overall, 13% against H3N2 viruses, and 55% against less common influenza B viruses. Vaccine effectiveness is usually approximately 60% when the circulating viruses are well matched to the viruses in the vaccine. This means that usually 
A vaccinated person is about 60% less likely to get sick with the flu and need a doctor's visit than an unvaccinated person. CDC is optimistic that the 2015-2016 vaccine will offer good protection against the flu this season. Two of the vaccine virus components from last season, the influenza A H3N2 virus and the influenza B virus, were updated for the 2015-2016 vaccine. Laboratory data as of September 5, 2015, suggests that most circulating viruses are like the vaccine viruses included in the vaccines for the upcoming season. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, has published recommendations for the use of seasonal influenza vaccines for the 2015-2016 season. For an overview of the recommendations, we spoke to Dr. Lisa Groskopf with the Influenza Division of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Routine annual influenza vaccination is recommended for all persons six months of age and older who do not have contraindications. Optimally, vaccination should occur before the onset of influenza activity. Vaccination should continue to be offered as long as influenza viruses are circulating in the community. The 2015-2016 U.S. licensed trivalent influenza vaccines contain hemagglutinin derived from an A. California 7 2009 H1N1 like virus, an A. Switzerland 9715293 2013 H3N2 like virus, and a B. Phuket 3073-2013 like virus from the Yamagata lineage. Quadrivalent influenza vaccines contain these three vaccine viruses and a B. Brisbane 60-2008 like virus from the Victoria lineage. Various influenza vaccine products are available for the 2015-2016 season. A table listing the products is available online. Inactivated influenza vaccines abbreviated as IIV, are available as trivalent and quadrivalent products. Age indications vary by product, formulation, and presentation. Live attenuated influenza vaccine, abbreviated as LAIV, is available only as a quadrivalent product. LAIV is indicated for healthy persons 2 through 49 years of age who are not pregnant. There is new and updated information on influenza vaccine products for the 2015-2016 season. First, a Fluria IIV is approved for intramuscular administration via the Stratus needle-free jet injector for persons 18 through 64 years of age. Next, the age indication for the recombinant influenza vaccine, FluBlock, which was previously 18 through 49 years, has been expanded to persons 18 years of age and older. And finally, Fluzone Intradermal Quadrivalent is approved for persons 18 through 64 years of age. It is expected that the quadrivalent formulation will replace the previously available trivalent Fluzone Intradermal. In cases where more than one type of vaccine is appropriate and available, ACIP does not express a preference for use of any particular product. A severe allergic reaction to influenza vaccine is a contraindication to future receipt of the vaccine, regardless of the component suspected of being responsible for the reaction. Severe allergic and anaphylactic reactions can occur in response to various influenza vaccine components, but such reactions are rare. With the exceptions of the recombinant influenza vaccine, FluBlock, and the cell culture-based inactivated influenza vaccine, Flusilvax, Influenza vaccines are prepared by propagation of virus in embryonated eggs. Recommendations for influenza vaccination of persons who report an allergy to eggs remain unchanged from last season. A flowchart to assist healthcare personnel in assessing egg allergy is available online.
Children six months through eight years of age require two doses of influenza vaccine administered at least four weeks apart during their first season of vaccination. Some children in this age group who have received influenza vaccine previously will also need two doses. For the 2015-2016 season, children six months through eight years of age who have previously received a total of two or more doses of trivalent or quadrivalent influenza vaccine before July 1, 2015 require only one dose. It does not matter if the two previous doses were administered during the same season or consecutive seasons. Children in this age group who have not previously received a total of two or more doses of trivalent or quadrivalent influenza vaccine before July 1, 2015 require two doses administered at least four weeks apart. A flow chart to assist healthcare personnel in determining the number of doses needed is available online. Last season, ACIP recommendations stated a preference for LAIV versus IIV for healthy children two through eight years of age. Data from subsequent studies of LAIV and IIV vaccine effectiveness indicated that LAIV did not perform as well as expected. For the 2015-2016 season, LAIV is no longer preferred to IIV for healthy children two through eight years of age. For healthy children two through eight years of age who have no contraindications or precautions, either LAIV or IIV is an appropriate option. No preference is expressed for LAIV or IIV for any person two through 49 years of age when either vaccine is appropriate. An age-appropriate formulation of vaccine should be used. Beginning in the 2010-2011 influenza season, ACIP recommended annual influenza vaccination for all persons six months of age and older. But Protection of persons at higher risk for influenza-related complications or those with increased risk of transmission to others should continue to be a focus of vaccination efforts. These persons include children younger than five years, adults 50 years of age and older, persons with chronic medical conditions, pregnant women, American Indians and Alaska Natives, and healthcare personnel. The full recommendations and additional resources, including patient education materials, are available at www.cdc.gov flu. Healthcare personnel continue to demonstrate their commitment to combating influenza disease. As more influenza vaccines become available, immunization providers will need to choose the type of vaccine most appropriate for their patient population. In this section of our program, we will focus on frequently asked questions about influenza vaccine storage, handling, and administration. During influenza season, we receive a number of questions from healthcare personnel. Let's address some of the most frequently asked questions. What are CDC's recommendations for storing influenza vaccines? CDC recommends storing influenza vaccine in a standalone refrigerator or a pharmaceutical purpose-built unit. These units can vary in size from compact, under-the-counter style to large, standalone units. If a household combination refrigerator-freezer is used to store vaccines, CDC recommends using only the refrigerator compartment for refrigerated vaccines. CDC does not recommend storing any vaccine, including influenza vaccines, in a dormitory or bar-style refrigerator-freezer unit under any circumstances. Using dormitory-style units to store vaccines for children or other vaccines purchased with public funds is prohibited. At what temperature should influenza vaccine be stored? And what type of thermometers should be used for measuring temperatures in a vaccine storage unit? 
all influenza vaccines, including both inactivated and live attenuated vaccines, should be stored in the refrigerator between 35 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit or 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. CDC recommends providers use a calibrated continuous temperature monitoring device with a certificate of traceability and calibration testing. Digital data loggers are recommended for continuous temperature monitoring. When conducting influenza vaccination clinics at an off-site or satellite facility, what are the storage recommendations for this situation? CDC does not recommend routine transport of vaccines. If at all possible, have the vaccine delivered directly to the off-site or satellite facility. If vaccines must be transported to the facility, here are the do's and don'ts. Do take a limited amount of vaccine, only enough for the workday. Transportation and workday time should not total more than eight hours. CDC does recommend using a portable refrigerator unit or qualified container. Portable refrigerators and qualified containers are commercially available for purchase. CDC also recommends using a calibrated temperature monitoring device. The device should have a valid certificate of calibration, recording capabilities to monitor the temperature continuously, and a digital display and buffered probe. When transporting vaccine, do place it in the passenger area of the vehicle. Upon arrival, promptly unpack the vaccine and place it in an appropriate storage unit if available. If the vaccine must be kept in the transport container, read and document temperatures hourly. Now here are the don'ts. When transporting vaccine, do not reuse manufacturer shipping containers and supplies. Do not use frozen gel packs, ice, or dry ice. These can freeze the vaccine. Additional information is available in the vaccine storage and handling toolkit. How do you correctly interpret expiration dates on vaccine? And do all flu vaccines expire at the end of flu season? No, all flu vaccines do not expire at the end of flu season. Although most influenza vaccines expire on June 30th, some expire during flu season. For example, live attenuated influenza vaccine, abbreviated LAIV, generally has a shelf life of 18 weeks. In addition, there can be confusion about expiration dates for multidose files. Most influenza vaccines in multidose files can be used through the expiration date printed on the label as long as the vaccine is stored properly and not contaminated or unless the manufacturer indicates otherwise. Sometimes the manufacturer specifies that once the multidose file has been entered or the rubber stopper punctured, the vaccine must be used within a certain number of days. This is commonly referred to as the beyond use date or BUD. When using a multidose vial of influenza vaccine for the first time, check the package insert to determine if the vaccine has a BUD. If it does, calculate the beyond use date using the time interval found in the vaccine's package insert. Initial and label the vaccine vial with the BUD. Between uses, store the vaccine appropriately until the vial is empty or the beyond use date is reached. Any vaccine not used before the BUD should be discarded, even if there is vaccine left in the vial. Is it okay for a large clinic that administers lots of flu vaccine to draw up vaccines at the beginning of the clinic day? CDC recommends only drawing up vaccine just before administration. Vaccine manufacturers do not recommend that vaccines be pre-drawn in advance. These syringes are not approved for use as a storage system for drug products. CDC recommends using manufacturer-filled syringes for large immunization clinics. If vaccine must be pre-drawn, it should not be drawn up in advance of the clinic. 
Drawing up doses of vaccine hours or even days before a clinic is not acceptable. At the clinic site, no more than one multi-dose vial or 10 doses should be drawn up at one time by each person administering vaccine. At the end of the workday, any remaining vaccine in provider pre-drawn syringes should be discarded. What are the routes of administration for influenza vaccines? Influenza vaccines are administered by three different routes, intramuscular, intradermal, and intranasal. Most inactivated influenza vaccine products are administered by intramuscular or IM injection. There are only two routinely recommended sites for IM administration of vaccines. These are the vastus lateralis muscle in the anterolateral thigh and the deltoid muscle in the upper arm. Injection at these sites reduces the chance of involving neural or vascular structures. The needle should be long enough to reach the muscle mass and prevent vaccine from seeping into subcutaneous tissue, but not so long as to involve underlying nerves, blood vessels, or bone. Healthcare personnel should be familiar with the anatomy of the area where the vaccine will be injected. Guidance on recommended injection sites and needle selection can be found in ACIP's General Recommendations on Immunization and in the Epidemiology and Prevention of Vaccine-Preventable Diseases textbook, also known as the Pink Book. Because there are no large blood vessels in the recommended sites, ACIP states that aspiration before injection of vaccines is not necessary. As of August, 2014, the PharmaJet Stratus needle-free injection system was approved by the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, for use with one influenza vaccine product, a Fluria vaccine. Additional information can be found on the PharmaJet Stratus website. Fluzone intradermal is administered by the intradermal, or ID, route. This formulation is not the same as intramuscular formulations of inactivated influenza vaccine. Other inactivated influenza vaccine formulations should not be administered by the intradermal route. For the intradermal injection, a manufacturer-filled microinjection syringe is used to administer a 0.1 milliliter dose into the dermal layer of the skin in the deltoid region of the upper arm. Detailed administration instructions are included in the package insert. The third route used to administer influenza vaccine is intranasal, abbreviated as NAS. The live attenuated influenza vaccine, Flumist, is currently the only vaccine administered by this route. The vaccine dose is inside a special sprayer device. A plastic clip on the plunger divides the dose into two equal parts, which should be administered into each nostril. Detailed information on the nasal administration of LAIV is included in the manufacturer's product information. What guidance is there for preventing injury if patients faint after vaccination? Since 2005, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, has received an increasing number of reports of syncope, or fainting, in adolescents and young adults. Immunization providers should take appropriate measures to reduce the risk of injury from syncope. These include having the patient seated when administering the vaccine and knowing the symptoms that precede fainting, such as weakness, dizziness, and pallor, and take appropriate measures to prevent injuries if such symptoms occur. ACIP recommends providers strongly consider observing patients for 15 minutes after vaccination. Information on this topic is posted on the CDC's Vaccine Safety webpage. Can pregnant healthcare personnel administer LAIV? Yes, a pregnant woman may safely administer LAIV.
healthcare personnel with underlying medical conditions, those who are 50 years of age and older may also safely administer LAIV. The only exception to this would be healthcare personnel with immunosuppression severe enough to require a protective environment. A person with this level of immunosuppression is highly unlikely to be working. What should be documented in the medical record when a dose of flu vaccine is administered? By federal law, certain information must be documented in the patient's paper or electronic medical record or on a permanent office log. This includes the vaccine manufacturer, the lot number of the vaccine, the date the vaccine is administered, the name and title of the person who administered the vaccine, and the address of the facility where the permanent record will be kept, the vaccine information statement or VIS edition date, which is located on the back of the VIS in the lower right corner. Finally, the date the VIS is given to the patient, parent, or guardian. The National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act requires that a VIS be given to parents, legal representatives, or adult patients before administering any vaccine. Best practice guidelines also include documenting the expiration date, route, dosage or volume, and site. Healthcare personnel are also strongly encouraged to document the dose in the Immunization Information System, or IIS. In addition, your facility may require other documentation. Follow your facility's policies and procedures for medical documentation. Here is our final question. What strategies can be used to help prevent influenza vaccine administration errors? A common error is inadvertent administration of expired vaccine. Always check the expiration date before preparing or administering vaccine. Expired vaccine should never be administered. A 2014 MMWR article highlighted VAERS reports of expired LAIV being administered. As noted earlier, LAIV generally has an 18-week shelf life. The vaccination occurred after the first week of November in 95% of the reports, which is approximately 18 weeks from July 1st. This indicates that expiration dates were not being checked. Fortunately, no adverse health events were documented in 98% of the reports. In addition to administration of expired vaccine, other administration errors we frequently hear about include wrong dosage or amount, influenza vaccine administered outside of the product's indications, and wrong route, among others. Strategies to prevent administration errors include Educate all staff administering vaccine about the influenza vaccine inventory. Store vaccines with similar packaging on different shelves of the refrigerator. Label the vaccine in the storage unit with age or other unique indications. Use standard ACIP abbreviations. A link to the standardized abbreviations list can be found on the ACIP webpage. If you or your staff have additional questions, send them to us by email at nipinfo at cdc.gov. Continuing education is available for this program only through the CDC ATSDR training and continuing education online system at www.2a.cdc.gov slash TCE online. There are two very important pieces of information to receive CE for this program. First is the course number. The course number for this program is WD2589. That's WD2589. You must also have a verification code to complete the evaluation and post-test. The verification code is FLU-REX. That's capital F, 
lowercase l and u, uppercase r, lowercase e, c, s. Again, that's capital F, lowercase l and u, uppercase r, lowercase e, c, s. Thank you for joining us. It's been our pleasure to bring you this program.